The Awakening, the Revised Edition by Lilac Moon Chapter 8 Senate Spy Aftermath Padme groggily opened her eyes and focused on her husband, who knelt beside her. Hey, he cooed softly to her as he caressed her cheek. Honey, she squeaked as she stirred. Shh, you're safe, my love. You're going to be okay, he assured her. I'm sorry, she replied. For what? he asked. For making you doubt me, she answered. Never. I let jealousy almost overrule me. But I'll never doubt your love for me, he replied as she slowly sat up. Easy, Padme. You're still recovering from a toxic poison, he told her. I'm feeling much better, she assured him. Those filthy Neamondians better hope they never cross my path again. Same goes for Clovis. If he ever gets his lips that close to you again, I'll rip them right off his face. Anakin said, You're the only man I'll ever want or need, she assured him. I know, but that probably won't stop him from trying, he said. Maybe, but if he tries anything, then I hope he's ready to sing soprano because I'll knee him where it hurts and I'll enjoy it. Padme said, he smirked. I hope I get to see that. Though, I would have rather gotten the okay from the Chancellor to arrest him for his dealings with the Separatists. Anakin said. Well, it is a very rare thing when I agree with one of Palpatine's decisions these days. But this one I do. She replied. You do? He asked in surprise. Yes. While I would love to see that arrogant, greedy bastard rot in a tiny prison cell, it might not help if he is put on trial, Padme stated. Why not? Anakin said. Because Clovis is very wealthy, and he would hire a superb legal team. The case would be tied up for years in red tape before it would go to trial, all the while Clovis is walking free on bail, and then there's a possibility that he would be found not guilty and get away with it completely. She explained. He nodded. Like Newt Gunray, after the blockade trial. Anakin said, understanding her line of thinking. She nodded. Trust me, not arresting him is far worse. She said. How so? He asked. After every senator and the chancellor read the report I'm going to write, word of his dirty dealings will spread like wildfire. It will tarnish his reputation. He'll lose all credibility, and his career will never really recover from it. Eventually, he will cease to be a representative for his planet when he is voted out of office by a more credible person. He'll be lucky if they let him serve in Parliament or on the border at the university, Padme replied. Once again, he was impressed by her integrity and prowess in the political arena. He saw that she was trying to sit up and he stopped her. Please! You need to rest, he pleaded. I am. I was thinking about how relaxing a nice bubble bath would be. My ship has a very large tub in the fresher. Enough room for two. She hinted. He smirked. While that sounds amazing, how do you expect to relax if we both take a bath together? Because there won't be much relaxing going on. Rush Clovis entered his quarters that had been provided to him by his cohorts. He was seething and he swiped his hand along his desk, sending things flying everywhere. This was not how things were supposed to go. When Padme expressed an interest in seeing him again, he had been hopeful that she would finally be his. But not only was she not interested in him in the slightest, but she had been spying on him. It didn't change the way he felt about her, though the betrayal had cut deep. But she hadn't been the slightest bit interested in his charms. And though they both tried to hide it, he could see there was something between Padme and her bodyguard. Personally, he thought it was a crime for a woman of Padme's beauty and stature to be with a lowly second-class guard. He poured himself a glass of scotch and took a long sip. I don't give up that easy, Padme. 
We'll meet again Sunday, he said to himself. Padme slept soundly in bed after they had enjoyed a hot bath together. He covered her up as he buckled his belt on his pants and slipped his tunic on before going to the cockpit to check on their position. The comm was blinking and he noticed the encryption read Old Folks Home, which was the code in that the Jedi Order used. Anakin accepted the message and Mace and Yoda appeared on the screen. Masters. Anakin bowed respectively. Greetings, Knight Skywalker. Yoda nodded. Anakin, we received your report. Is the Senator all right? Mace asked. Yes, Master. She received the antidote in time and is resting now. Anakin said, That is good news. It is unfortunate that the Chancellor has chosen not to pursue criminal charges. Mace mentioned, I agree, Master. However, Senator Amidala made a valid point earlier. Senator Clovis will lose much of his credibility when word of his dealings spreads in the Senate. She thinks that his career will suffer irreparable damage. He'll be of little use to the Separatists anymore. Anakin replied, Go go with Senator Amidala, I do. Yoda stated, Mace nodded. Anakin, how long until you reach Coruscant? Mace asked. Approximately six hours, Master. Anakin replied. A situation has risen on Geonosis. The Separatists are attempting to retake the planet, and Poggle the Lesser is leading them. You and Ahsoka will join Obi-Wan, Luminaria, and Kia D, Mundi, who are already on their way with their troops. The situation is dire, and after you see the Senator safely to her home, you must return to the temple and ship out immediately. Mace instructed. Anakin's heart sank. Understood, Master. Anakin stated, as the transmission blinked out. He had hoped they would at least give him the rest of the day, and the evening when they arrived back on Coruscant. But that wouldn't be the case. Now he faced the task of telling Padme that they only had six hours left together, until he would need to leave again on another mission. He walked back to the cabin, and quietly slipped into the bedroom. He decided that he would at least try to get some sleep, since he didn't really want to wake her. He would at least get to hold her for a while. He took off his tunic, followed by his belt and pants, before slipping on a pair of sleep pants. He climbed into bed and took her in his arms. She cooed, instinctively turning in his arms to face him. Mummy, she said, as she opened her eyes blearily and gazed up at him. Sorry, I didn't mean to wake you. He replied, It's okay. How long till we get home? She asked. About six hours, he said with sadness, which she picked up on right away. What's wrong? She asked. He sighed. As soon as I take you home, I must report to the temple and ship out to Geonosis immediately. He told her. Geonosis again? She asked. He nodded. Poggle the Lesser has rallied quite the rebellion, and they're on the verge of retaking the planet. He replied. Then if we only have six hours together, then we should make good use of the time, she said. Yeah, before I'm up to my ears in my least favourite thing. Sand. He replied. But you should really be resting. He added. You expect me to try and sleep? When I know the minute we're back on Coruscant that you'll be leaving? She asked. He realised that it was an impossible thing to ask of her. I couldn't sleep, even if I wanted to now. Not when I need you like I do, she whispered. And I need you. The thought of being apart from you again is almost unbearable. I don't know how much longer I can do it. Anakin replied. Me either she confessed. It's not always going to be like this. When the war is over, we're going to have the life we've dreamed about. He promised. At home, on Naboo, in the Lake Country, where there's no war, no squabbling delegates, no corruption, and no judgement from those who don't understand us. Where there is only our love, she added. He smiled. Where our biggest dilemma will be which colour we paint the nursery. He added, she melted at his words. 
Before she had met him, she had never desired to have a child, but much had changed when she had fallen in love with her Jedi protector. Her first pregnancy had been unexpected, but she had embraced the possibility of having a baby with the man she loved. And when she had miscarried, it had been incredibly devastating. And since then, Padme desperately wanted a baby, and to hell with what people would tell them that they didn't belong together when they found out about their coupling, because he was a Jedi and she was a senator. But that was only what they were, not who they were. They were two people so in love that their hearts practically became one, and they were now unable to live without each other. She knew most would scoff at such a description, but no matter how whimsical or unrealistic it sounded to others, it was true to them, and it was who they were now. Anakin glanced down at her beautiful face, and, as always, he was captivated by her. Her gorgeous chocolate tresses fanned out on her pillow, and her eyes were lidded, glazed over with a passionate need for him. Anyway, moving on. Count Dooku observed the training arena from a distance, as a combatant wielding a crimson lightsaber. If one observed closely enough, though, they could see that the person making spare parts out of a slew of battle droids was only a small boy. He looked harmless, and even cute, until one saw his eyes. They glowed sithly yellow as he swept his lightsaber around and destroyed the last of the droids before extinguishing it. You did well, my young apprentice. Dooku recommended. The young boy bed. Thank you, my master, the boy replied coldly, which seemed foreign coming from such a cute little boy. Dooku hadn't been surprised that the child was adorable, considering his parentage. In fact, he'd been a little worried that the boy was much too small and petite, like his mother. But he was confident that he would grow tall, like his father, and fill out. It would only be a little over a year now until he would be a fully grown young adult, and ready to take his place at Sidious' side. He watched the child flick the sweat from his chocolate-coloured shaggy hair, and his eyes faded to a crystal blue. Hit the shower, and then Torn Wu will take you to your evening meal. Dooku ordered. The boy nodded obediently, his sweet cherub face reminding him of Sir Mitter Armadala. But that sweet face was that of a cold-blooded, heartless killer who would one day be the galaxy's most feared Sith Lord to ever exist. Anakin felt her tears splash on his neck as they held each other tightly on the veranda of their apartment in Republica 500. He pulled back and she held his handsome face in her hands. Please be careful, she sobbed. He nodded. I live only to come back to you. You're my life, he replied as he lowered his lips to hers in what could be their final kiss until he returned to her again and he would return. Nothing would stop him from coming back to her. I love you, she whispered as he held her tight. And I love you, my sweet angel, he whispered back. R2 word sadly from the speeder, indicating it was time to go. He parted from her and hopped onto his speeder, and she watched as he was once again carried away from her. Please keep him safe. She whispered into the force, and once she could no longer see his speeder, she returned into her empty, lonely apartment, longing for the days where they would never be separated again. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that one. Oh, bittersweet that one, sad. And a rush Clovis, keep an eye on him, he's going to be very important in this story. Anyway, you guys know the drill. Like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell to get notified for whenever I upload a new video. Have a good day, night or whatever time zone you're in. Bye my guys, gals and non-binary pals. I'll see you in another video. Take care.